Good afternoon. Let's go ahead and uh, get started with our panel discussion. Uh, let me open with a word of prayer as we get this started. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you again for this time you've given us. We thank you for uh, the food you've provided. We thank you for this afternoon and uh, the sessions that are still to come. We do pray your blessing upon this session, Lord, that you would give our speakers, our panelists, uh, clarity of mind and speech as they uh, discuss some of these important truths, uh, some of the other aspects of the things that have already been said, some of the questions uh, that might be on people's minds, Lord. Give us all, again, a sense of humility as we come to the truths uh, of you that you have revealed by your word. We thank you for those, and we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, we want to thank our speakers. They're all together here on the same stage at the same time. This is our one panel discussion for this year's event. We have Dr. Sam Renahan, Dr. James Dolzal, Dr. Matthew Barrett, and Dr. Richard Barcellus. And myself, David Jarizzo, will be asking some questions and then really letting this kind of go. Go where it goes. And so our panelists are encouraged to interact and to even ask each other questions. Uh, we all know that Rich will be doing that uh, so that he doesn't have to answer as many, I'm sure. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, we're going to give this at least a full hour. Uh, our next session will start at 3 o'clock, so if this goes uh, beyond 2.30, um, that's all part of the plan. All right, this first question is for Dr. Dolzal. Dr. Dolzal, could you tell us what you meant by your comment in your last session that denials of des divine simplicity entail or imply, or however you said it, uh, some form of atheism? Yeah, hurry. Hurry. Uh, so, I think the first time I came across a statement put that starkly was uh, in Ed Fazer's book on Five Proofs for God's Existence. And what Fazer is getting at, I think he's, I think he's right about mm -hmm. this, is that if we deny divine simplicity altogether, that is to say, if there is no simple first cause of being, that is to say, if the, which, which would be to say there isn't one from whom and through whom and to whom are all things, you have effectively chosen to do without a God, without a, you have chosen a view of reality that has dismissed anything like an absolute creator. Now, that doesn't mean that people doctrinally draw that conclusion and say, well, I question divine simplicity because atheism is looking pretty good to me. <laughs> In other words, I don't, I don't think they're thinking through it that way. Right. But the implications of a God composed of parts, and if that is the first cause of all being, then that, which then it wouldn't be the first cause of all being, Without a simple God, you si there simply is no, no pun intended. I do this. I do pun My wife loves puns. I hate puns, and then I make them all the time. I just, it's unconscious, but it happens. Yeah. Uh, you, you are effectively opting out of a creator. Um, but I think, we, I think we have to make the case to someone that a non-simple creator couldn't be the first cause, and you have to explain to them why, and if you're gonna do without that, you are doing without what the Bible calls God. And that's what Fazer is after, and I think he's, I think his reasoning on that is sound, but I think the reason he puts it so starkly is just to say, this isn't one of those areas where we should draw a truce and agree to disagree. This is an area where the disagreement needs to stand fast. Um, and it's why, it's why you, if you look at the ortho, is it, well, Sam will correct me, uh, the General Baptist put out a confession of faith, the Orthodox, John, give me the right title, the Orthodox something or other, right, or, Creed. Creed, right around the time, it's late, one year later, one year later after the Second London. Um, and it is, and the Second London is excellent on divine simplicity, just like the Savoy was, just like the Westminster was, just like the 39 Articles, just like, the Fourth Lateran Council was in the medieval period, um, just like the General Baptists are a year later in their creed as well. And my point, it's just one of those vanilla kind of Christian doctrines, or if you don't like vanilla, meat and potatoes, um, it's, the kind of, it's the kind of Christian doctrine that without which, where's your God? Mm. It's that kind of doctrine. So you'll find, if you go early, early in the church, Irenaeus of Lyon is saying that 
that God is simple and that we don't believe that he is composed of parts. And then he says, as all the pious are wont to confess, he'll say it like that, um, which is to say, everybody who actually worships God believes this. I think that's, and, and so to Fazer's more recent comment, I don't think that he's being extraordinarily provocative. I think maybe he's being appropriately provocative given what is at stake in the doctrine of simplicity. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I could not agree more. Uh, I think one of the reasons why Christians sometimes struggle to see this point is because in our own minds, we have put simplicity over here as this suspicious thing removed from everything else we know about God's immutability or God being timeless or God being impassable and so on and so on and so on. Once we do that, uh, it's very difficult to see the point that, that James is trying to make. However, if we understand that when we are speaking about simplicity, we are simultaneously also in the next breath, I, I think we should say, saying, and God does not change because he is without parts and because he's without parts, he does not change. And we go on from there to say, well, if he does not change, he can't be corrupted, you see? So the, the line is a very quick one, because as soon as you say God does have parts, you have to say, I, I would argue, he does change. And if he does change, I think you would have to say, I would argue, is, he, is his being, is it possible for him to be corruptible? So when you start to read some of the older authors, they, they connect those dots. And for them, they can say, in the same sentence, yeah, if God is not simple, he is corruptible. And of course, that's not Christian. <laughs> that's not the Christian God. We can't have a God who would fall apart in this way. And maybe some of it is just clarifying what we mean by divine simplicity, because I don't, I don't want to suggest that being um, confused or mystified or unclear about this doctrine means that you are secretly an atheist and didn't know it. I, <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. Uh, but only that, the, and I think this was Faisal's point, the denial of the doctrine, that is to say the knowing and understanding denial of this doctrine results in the forfeiture of an absolute creator. To the ignorance of it, or the ignorance of the fullness of the doctrine and all the finer points. I'll just speak for myself on this stage, but others know who they are. <laughs> uh, if that were the case, then... Yeah. You know, I was pa I was pastoring and still sort of atheistic on certain Sundays, and I don't think I was. Right. I don't think I was. Uh, I think I was pastoring and needed help in being more clear. But I believe that God was the absolute first cause and creator of all things. It maybe took a little time to understand how, why necessarily that means God without parts. But as soon as you come into God without parts and you start reading a little bit in the tradition, by the tradition I mean like, just say, let's just say John Gill back with the exception of, like, Herman Bovink. Uh, 1750, 1760 backward, you just find it everywhere, and you start to understand why. Like, this is one of, it's interesting, because now it's a kind of, it seems like a boutique, kind of offbeat little doctrine for people who have strange ways of thinking and speaking. You know, I'm, I'm one of those, I'm for sure. Um, and it just seems like kind of, it, it's a, it's a, it's a entertaining little piece of dogmatic minutia for people with um, overly inquisitive minds. Whereas I want to, I want to really emphatically say it's exactly the opposite of that. If you if you just survey the history of the church, it's the thing. I mean, the Belgic Confession. It's the first thing they say in the whole confession that we worship only one God who's simple. It's just the very first thing they say, and then everything sort of comes from there. Because simple says most absolute. In fact, our confession connects that. Without parts, culminating in that middle paragraph, most absolute, if you don't have the without parts, you'll never get to the most absolute or the most free. So I believed most absolute. I believed most free. I didn't perhaps see why simplicity was necessary to maintaining that. But that's a little different than denying it and, impl and implicitly being an atheist. So I want to be measured in how I say that. Okay. If we bring this conversation into the doctrine of the Trinity, mm -hmm. this point 
becomes. Uh, now, you, that, that, now, you're, now you're making it complicated. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, let's complicate things. Um, when we bring, <laughs> when we bring, when we bring this into the doctrine of the Trinity, I would go so far that to say that you do not have a Trinity in the orthodox sense of the word apart from simplicity. So in other words, because I hear that type of objection all the time, oh, this is just a fascinating speculative piece that you, know, you intellectuals are curious about. When you go back to the church fathers and you look at the fourth century in particular, what do you discover? You discover that the Cappadocians, the Gregories of the world, as they are arguing against a heresy like Arianism, they are doing so by appealing to the Trinity's simplicity. You remove that from their argument, they have very little to say. In other words, in order for our church fathers to argue and defend and perpetuate orthodoxy, they find simplicity absolutely essential to, to not just understanding the Trinity, but articulating the Trinity in a way that does not then succumb to any variety of subordinationist heresies, whether they're Arianism or semi-Arianism or other versions. So it is, it is that essential. I think, yeah, it's been flipped around. It's only in the modern period that all of a sudden, oh, isn't this interesting, this idea of simplicity? <laughs> For everybody else in the great tradition, it's just a matter of orthodoxy. Good. Thank you, Gip. Did you have well, something else to add? Well, I don't know. it's already on the list, but I've, and I've been asked that question of just, well, we all know Trinity. Simplicity is still, you know, sort of on probation, so to speak. Um, am I really going to, you know, accept it or not? And uh, I don't know, maybe you've had comments, maybe others of you have had comments where, yeah, of course Trinity, but if simplicity... If simplicity doesn't cohere with Trinity, then simplicity's got to go. Something to that effect. And I think the first time I heard that critique, I didn't know exactly how to respond to it initially, except that it seemed to me that if you went back to the great Trinitarian century, the fourth century, and the Council of Nicaea, and all the debates that raged around that, and then Constantinople in 381, the, it, it seemed that, in fact, the most basic commitment was simplicity, and however you spoke of the Trinity, it needed to be spoken of in such a way that didn't violate the commitment to divine simplicity. And that seems to be sort of the baseline uh, across the fourth, through the fourth century Orthodox. Um, and I think that's the, so to your point though, without simplicity, then why couldn't we recast the biblical data in a tripartite or tritheistic direction? And I, I would argue that without divine simplicity, we don't actually have the theological mechanism that absolutely necessitates Trinity as opposed to tritheism. Um, it's the reason we say that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and yet not three gods. Simplicity is why we say that. Um, it absolutely enshrines the monotheism of our Trinitarianism. And I think that's, but you don't find long arguments for that in the fourth century because they didn't think that argument needed to be made in the fourth century. I think everyone saw that implication. In the 21st century, I don't think we can take that for granted anymore. Mm. Um, yes. Hello. I just, this means a lot to you. You're very excited, passionate about this. James wrote his dissertation on this doctrine, so that's one reason why it's so important to him. He's got to justify all the hard work he did put into it. <laughs> Um, it is very basic, though, to Christian monotheism and Christian Trinitarian doctrine. And the older, the farther back you go in the literature, the more obviously assumed it is or sometimes articulated. I just wanted to bring up something that's kind of fascinating. When we, in our day, talk about practical things, it's typically fluffy and tells you how to live your life kind of stuff, you know, application, use, all that stuff. In the old days, when they, somebody wanted to write a book on the uh, 
Daily Walk of the Christian, or what's the name of that book, Jim? It was back when you probably saw it in its first publication. Yeah, Lou, Lewis Bailey, and the first chapter includes a section on? It's all about divine simplicity. Doctrine of God, okay, but including divine simplicity and all that. So um, God is pretty important, and simplicity helps us main what you're, both of you are trying to say is maintain both Christian monotheism and yet a Christian doctrine of the Trinity so that we can still say there are the persons are really distinguishable among each other in the Godhead. There are real distinctions, right? And yet there is substantial unity. So there's not, the three don't like access a fourth thing periodically to do divine things. They just are divinity subsisting or something like that. It's weird. Yeah. It's, did you say it's weird? Strange. You said the Trinity is weird? Strange. You know what? Mysterious. Indeed. That's the word you were looking for. Sam said it's mysterious. Well, what, what's the line? It would that be strange. It would be strange if God were not strange. Yeah, it would be strange if God weren't no, strange I, I, to I, us. I, yeah, I, I think I first came across that in a Gavin Ortland article, and it was an enviable line because I thought this is just exact. I think he's just got it right. We actually want kind of a blasé, predictable, big version of ourselves without sin and body God. And I, I'll tell you right now, like I think our, I say our church's kind of Protestant evangelicalism is absolutely suffering under that excessively low view of God, even though in their mind it's a high view, it's only relatively high in as much as it's a kind of blown up man without a body and sin. And I think that's, this is, this is what I love about divine simplicity. It, it's not remotely Superman. It's, it's not even holy angel. It infinitely excels that. A doctrine like this, I, I had this experience teaching undergraduates for years where you would introduce a doctrine like this to a 20 year old who maybe had grown up in the church in a kind of more of a emotional sentimentalist style Christianity. And this absoluteness and this transcendence and this irreducibility of being, which entails everything, goodness and wisdom and love and justice, not an instance of it, but the thing itself as such in person, that with a certain, I don't want to suggest that they were all just falling over themselves in ecstasy about this, because certain these are these are twenty year olds, so there's not. <laughs> but a great number of them, a great number of them, you could just tell that they were thrilling to the idea that God was infinitely beyond the kind of sentimentalist version of God that had been presented to them. The doctrine of simplicity, I think, is very liberating in this respect. It, it, it unboxes God from your big Superman without a body and sin view of God into something really other. And it gives you, it, it, I think it just imbues wonder and awe uh, and confidence and hope uh, in us. Yeah, um, this is just a conversation, right? Sure. Um, those are nice socks, Matthew. <laughs> Not that kind of conversation. Anybody want to see my socks? David, probably he's losing the thread. They're white, white yeah. like this always. You've got to pull us back. Um, so back to unity and trinity. Um, unity and trinity. Now, some people say that doctrines like divine simplicity come from a more of an Augustinian God and his substance and unity and oneness. Then you tag on the trinity later but if you started with the Trinity, that hard identity version of simplicity doesn't work. So we should, we should start with the Trinity and then kind of, I don't know, weave divine unity in or something like it. You know the issue and, and the pushback on that, so uh, wow us with your vocabulary. No, but the, but the difficulty is if you begin with the who, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and you, don't, and you know nothing and have, have made no commitment yet to the what, then you're proceeding talking about the who, but you, but the things you say about the who are very quickly going to be complicated if you don't have, if you haven't said what you're talking about. So if I said, let's talk about Joey. Who's Joey? 
Exa yeah, and you don't know whether I'm talking about a baby kangaroo or that guy from uh, New Kids on the Block. <laughs> that's even before your yeah, time, is isn't it? <laughs> Sounds like you're, that's a big cultural miss. Uh, uh, it was a boy band thing. Anyway. Uh, do, he, he's old he, enough he, to remember them. Yeah, boy band. Anyway. Anyway. I know. You're I, thought it, I thought it was a contemporary TV show. It was after classic show. rock before whatever came after that. After what? Uh, after classic rock. What kind of rock? Point, no, what no, kind of no. rock? No, not going to. Classic. I know. I know. But my <laughs> point, though, is if I say Joey, and, you, and we haven't said we're talking about a kangaroo or a man yet. Do you know what I'm after? And then all the, all the features that characterize a kangaroo or a man. In other words, if we start with the divine persons and not with the divine mm -hmm. substance, then there is a wide range of uh, room for mischief and sort of innovation to creep in. Uh, does this make sense? In other words, how do, you, how do you get very far into conversation about who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you haven't said that God is some, if you haven't said things like God is simple, God is without body, God is without parts, God is eternal, God is wise, good, loving, just. In other words, if you don't start with the substantial reality how do you make progress in your discussion of the personal subsistence? If that, I, I mean, that would be my concern with, why don't we just start with the Trinity instead of start with the unity of the divine nature? Right, right. You know, some people that are saying we need to start with the Trinity um, confess, at least one guy does, the Westminster Confession. He's a part of a Westminster Confession denomination. But, but the Westminster Confession starts with the oneness of God. Right? I, I mean, and our confession, I think, accelerates divine oneness and unity. Uh, and more, all, and more. also the Bible. Well, that was, uh, that was my next question. Does, do our confessions then reflect a scriptural motif of highlighting divine unity, Old Testament, and then revealing what was mysteriously contained in the Old, uh, explicitly in the New, so that our confessions follow a good model? the way God has revealed himself in scripture. Would you, you're nodding your head, yes. Yeah, yes, you know, but the concern is people want to say, but that's not Christian, because if I'm, just a, if I'm just a bare monotheist, then that doesn't yet distinguish me from uh, a Jew or a Muslim. And so there, there's an apologetic agenda sometimes at work, which is to say, I've got to, the first foot I put forward has got to be my Christian foot. And the Christian foot is the Trinitarian foot. The monotheist foot is the not is the what I share with other false faiths. Uh, do you know what I'm after? And so there's this idea: I'm more Christian if I start with the if I start with the three persons than with the divine unity. Um, it, that's a that is a fairly recent apologetic maneuver. It's not it's not one that historically the church has ever seemed terribly convinced is necessary and in fact the the problems with starting with three persons before you say what you're talking about or say something about his manner of existence actually opens the door to all sorts of innovation in your doctrine of god um, moreover the fact that you happen to i mean avicenna a medieval islamic philosopher believes that god is simple uh, so does moses maimonides a medieval jewish philosophical theologian uh, so does anselm a uh, medieval Christian theologian for whom Matthew has a special affinity. Um, but before that, so did, so did uh, Irenaeus, and so did um, Hilary of Poitiers, and so did Augustine. And so the point that there's this point of commonality on a doctrine like divine simplicity, for instance, I don't think should be something that causes alarm for us. I mean, it's, it's not like we're not going to say the one true God is triune. Um, it's, not, it's not like we're hiding that away, but there's a certain sense of which, without divine simplicity, how do you say three who are one without thinking three individuals of a kind or, through, or three parts of a composite? Do, do you know what I'm after? And so I think the temptation is, and, if, and this is the problem, if you start with the persons, you're going to immediately, whether you think it or not, you're going to immediately assume some kind of unity. And is it going to be the unity of parts in a whole, or is it going to be the unity of a corporation of three pet persons, you know, the God team uh, that does great stuff and like that? In other words, you're, you are going to import some conception of unity to those three. But if you've pushed simplicity off and decided to save it for later, 
then are you naturally going to move from a consideration of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to simple unity? Almost certainly you're not, unless you already have a reason to believe that God is simple. I don't know. These are ways I'd push on that, but I don't want to torture you. So, so much of this is, is not understood by natural man in his natural condition. Would you, would you say that? Or, or let me maybe put it to a finer point. Is the, is the triunity of God something that can be known outside of special revelation? Are you taking a vote? We can start with Sam. <laughs> no. Okay. No. No. <laughs> Is the triunity of God something that can be known apart from special revelation? It's a yes or no. It's yes or no. We distinguish. No. Yeah, we do distinguish because, well, anyway, yeah, no, it is an article of faith. It needs to be, it is uh, uh, revealed above nature, outside of nature, in scripture by God. But once we get the doctrine of the Trinity from the scriptures, then we can really interpret the world Trinitarian. You want to elaborate no, on No, I that? don't. Yeah. <laughs> No, because James will probably yeah. tell me I'm a no, medieval just, heretic. No, it just sounds like a book plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, did you have something to bail rid Well, down? look, James, you do it with a psychological analogy, right? Yes, but I don't think that I can. Ex yeah, but that's a that's an after that's a that's something that I think can be done responsibly after special revelation. After. That's right. Yeah. That, that, that was and my there, point. I'm looking for an analogy that serves faith. Whereas, I mean, we should be let's be clear on this and not be. Well, I'll speak for myself. I said let's, but I'll just speak for myself. Um, if you ask that same question though that you asked David about divine simplicity, mm -hmm. um, is divine simplicity something for which I am utterly beholden to the scriptures? in order to have knowledge of it, I would say no. We, we saw you illustrate that by arguing the doctrine from jets. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a way to, con I mean, as I contemplate the insufficiency of the created world and I contemplate yeah. what, is the, what is the necessary foundation of causality in a world that isn't its own explanation or reason for being, um, I think a natural theological argument can be made for the necessity of God as first cause and as necessarily simple. By the way, but that doesn't oh. say, but that's also not saving knowledge either. Mm. And that's not, that knowledge doesn't get me a little closer to regeneration or to communion with the God against whom I sin. It's true, it's a true knowledge of God, but it's not a true saving knowledge of God um, that comes in the knowledge of God as triune and the sending forth of his son and pouring forth of his spirit and the work they do on our behalf. But, but nevertheless, I do think that we can say, I don't know, we should talk about it briefly, mixed and unmixed articles of the faith. Yeah. You, you introduced yeah. that language, I think. Yeah. Where in an, in, a, in an unmixed article of the faith, we mean something that we believe as Christians solely because scripture reveals it to us and we have no other source for that knowledge. Uh, that God subsists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, is one of those kinds of articles of the faith. The incarnation of the Son, the hypostatic union, his atoning death and subsequent resurrection, his second coming, the final judgment, the general resurrection of the just and the unjust, none of these things can I arrive at necessarily by rightly contemplating nature. That God is one and not many, that God is simple, that God is wise, that God is benevolent, that God is all-powerful, and many other invisible attributes besides these, I can know by a right contemplation of the things that are made because in there, in there, God has made them known to me. So we call them mixed when we talk about articles like that because I could arrive, well, I'll just give you an example with divine simplicity. You could do a, an Aquinas style argument and move from an unmoved mover or first cause, the first two of his five ways, to a conclusion that the first cause must be purely actual and therefore simple, not composed of principles more fundamental than himself, otherwise he wouldn't be first. You could make that argument. But you could also, but you could, oh, yeah, I know. You, it could be done, but you. But you could also just read Romans. We 11. need to breathe. Can we just breathe? Yes. 
no, okay, pull, pull the string again, but, Matthew. But you, could all, but you could also do Romans 11.36, contemplate the necessary implications of Romans 11.36, and arrive at the same conclusion. Uh, and so my point is, sometimes, sometimes you can arrive at the same, same theological truth about God by a right contemplation of nature or scripture. There's a mixed article. Simplicity is a mixed article. Trinity is not a mixed article. Nevertheless, it can't discard the mixed article of simplicity as we contemplate Trinity. Um, as a, I, I actually taught him all that, so thank you. Well, I edit his papers. Are you asking a question? Yeah, about the uh, uh, mixed and unmixed articles. So, can uh, can an article of faith? contradict um, nature, can there be two levels of truth, basically? What is that concept called? Occam's double truth theory? Yeah, yeah, that one. Ding, ding, ding. Everyone, you got it. Everyone was thinking that. Everyone was thinking about that. <laughs> So, so that scripture tells us one thing, nature tells us another, they're contradictory, but both are true, kind of thing. Is that the, was that what you're talking about? Because if so, we, we need to get another speaker. Yeah, definitely not. In fact, interestingly, at the, at the Sorbonne, at the University of Paris, uh, there, was a, there was a liberal arts faculty that were teaching that at the time that Aquinas was there in the 13th century called, I don't know, they have a fancy name, the Latin, the Latin Avarus. These were doctrinaire Aristotelians who basically said Aristotle is truth, um, philosophically, and then they would say, and the Bible is true theologically, and these things cannot cohere, and that's it. And so when it comes to philosophy class, we'll just teach Aristotle without modification, which by the way, Aquinas definitely did not think you should do. Um, and so there was this kind of, there's a philosophical truth and there's a theological truth, and my faith requires me to just simply cast myself upon the scriptures, even though there's a philosophical certainty that says something the opposite of that. I think we should absolutely reject that. Natural theology is not in competition with specially revealed theology, but we should say that specially revealed theology exceeds the bounds and what it reveals over and above natural theology, and only the specially revealed theology give us a disclosure of God as Savior and what he's done to save us, um, and other things like about our hope and about our eternal state and things like that. So how about this, does sacred theology Correct, because I've heard somebody say this before. Correct natural uh, revelation. No, because natural revelation is infallible. Thank you. Interpretations of it are fallible. Now, we could say a sacred theology hmm. should correct our natural theology, our conclusions from the revelation, right? Because this this we could be wrong. going to make people uncomfortable, Richard. But well, I mean, it's out there, and Dr. Renahan wanted me to make people uncomfortable, so am I doing it right, Jim? Is this I what you said to do? Yeah. Don't, just, don't, dra don't drag Dr. Renahan into this. That's not fair. <laughs> uh, I think, look, look at it like this. Let's just, let's just take an unmoved mover argument like Aquinas's, that God, is, that God is absolute first in being, and is, there's nothing in God that is being actualized by the creature. God actualizes the creature, the creature doesn't actualize God. That's an argument he made. I mean, he believes that because he believes the Bible, but he also believes that because you can make a natural theological argument for that. So let's just say that he makes a natural theological argument for that, and he holds to that as a truth. God causes all things, but things don't cause God. Okay? And then an open theist, a biblicist, comes along and reads the Bible and reads a verse about God being grieved in his heart by the activity of a creature. And says, ah, but look, here are things in God, like grief, that aren't from God, that are actually from the creature, operating on God, thereby causing states of being in God. Uh, and therefore, my literal and plain reading of the Bible contradicts your unmoved mover. Who's right? The guy with natural, and you know how it looks for, for us in this kind of, for us in the fundamentalist and post-fundamentalist West, something deep inside of you wants to say the guy... Matthew's Bible's open, so I'll pick on him. The guy with the open Bible's got to be right. The guy with philosophical speculation's got to be wrong. Except in this case, the guy with the philosophical speculation is thinking rightly, and the guy with the Bible's interpreting wrongly. 
Uh, and so I don't, I don't want to make it a natural theology comes and fixes your interpretation of the Bible, but it does need to, in a subordinated way, cohere. And this is why we should say that, because the author of nature and the author of Scripture is one. And God is not against God, mm. even if Scripture exceeds what he says to us in natural revelation. But definitely not. You don't, you don't use the Bible to correct natural revelation. But you can use the Bible, obviously, to correct bad natural theology, yeah. of which there are many bad natural theologies. All right. Do you have any other questions, or can I ask? I think you should let David do his we, job. Yeah, yeah not appropriate. No, you're, you're fine. It's, it's been good. It's been good. Let's talk about the great tradition for uh, a few minutes here. Um, regarding the great tradition, are we, and Sam, maybe this is uh, for you to start with, are we talking about uniformity in the expression of that tradition? Or within the great tradition, is there any room for variety or diversity of expression of that tradition? Does that make sense? So the, the name or the term great tradition is, it's a name. Yeah. And what I think the great tradition is may be quite different from mm. what you or someone else thinks the great tradition is. What I was trying to emphasize in my lesson earlier is that we should have a high admiration and regard for collective statements from the church, especially creedal, uh, conciliar, or confessional documents mm. where the wisdom of many people has come together to say, we agree mm. uh, on this thing. Or when we look at many writings over time and they say the same thing, uh, not just repeating, but agreeing. I agree with this. I also believe this. I also believe this. You know, a creed or a confession could be many people agreeing all at the same time. Uh, a tradition of literature could be many people agreeing over time. And when we look at that and we see the same things being believed or the same things being confessed, you won't find uniformity. Uh, you won't. But you will find often unity. Uh, and so I think that we find the greatest unity in those collective documents and in literature that continues to teach those things. And on certain doctrines, you'll find more or less unity. So as, as James was pointing out, something like divine simplicity or the doctrine of God, what we receive, what is traditioned to us in the Second London Confession, as James said, is very vanilla. It's very common. This is what has been said. This is how it has been said for these reasons. Uh, and so would there be anyone who would disagree with that in the history of the church? No doubt there would be. Uh, but you won't find uniformity, but you will find unity in the great tradition, but anyone could define that really in terms that they want to. Uh, I would look at that term and see it as the, the overall unity and commonality of the faith of the church throughout history. So, so what are those, and when we look back through the history of the church, uh, what are those key points of uh, uh, agreement that we must be, you know, holding on to today and, and passing on, being faithful to? Uh, you mentioned basically two areas, I think, quite explicitly in your session. Uh, doctrine of God and doctrine of Christ. Um, what what are some of those those areas? What you're really asking me to do is to write a confession of faith. <laughs> uh, what are the fundamental yeah. articles? Yeah, yeah. Is the question that you're asking. And well, we have uh, just over 30 of them in our confession. Mm. Uh, so I would say those are all fundamental. Uh, they are the fundamental articles. But typically, one would say the uh, um, the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian Creed and the Chalcedonian Christology. Uh, we see those things especially, uh, which are heavily weighted towards the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ as being the most to be treasured, the most to be valued, the most to be defended, and the most united, we might say, um, in the history of the church as we look back. But if you ask me to enumerate all of the fundamental articles of the, of the great tradition, uh, I would need more time and a piece of paper. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barcellus, God doesn't change, right? It's not a hard, that's not a hard one. <laughs> so then how does he go from not creating to creating? Um, I edited a paper once called Eternal Creator of Time. So I'd like to defer to Dr. Dulzal. All I remember is the edits. I don't remember your argument, so. That is pretty sad. So, but, but. You're telling on yourself. 
Sorry. I'm 60, you know? <laughs> I forget things. Um, so that's a good question. It seems like God was not at some point in time creator and then he became creator. Scripture even says uh, that God has become my Lord or something like that as well. So, so the question is, <clears throat> James, you know what the question is. Given creation, it seems like God went from not doing something to doing something and yet you believe in timeless eternity. Yeah, and ti like and timeless time. divine operation. And, to, to, and what? Uh, <laughs> God, God's doings are timeless. What is done is not timeless. Like this is what, I mean, God is doing, God is doing this. He's, create, he's made all of us. He's sustaining us. He gives us life, breath, and all things. If you blink your eyes in a second, um, God is at work in you, you know, to live, move, and have your being. Um, so the operations of God are many and temporal. Um, in the effects. The operation in God himself himself is eternal and simple. Um, I think, well, let's just, I, we'll just drill down into it and I'm, I'll give you the answer that comes to my mind, which is this. It's a confusion about agency. The agent, and so a patient is something that's done unto and an agent is a doer. So oh, there we go. Okay. Define your terms. So there we go. An agent's a doer. And when a finite agent and a temporal agent begins to do things, like, you asked me a question, and I began to speak, and so I enacted some agency, and I moved as the speaker, I'm the agent speaking now, I moved from a state of not in the act of speaking to in the act of speaking, and there was a coordination between my newness of agency and a newness of effect, namely you heard words coming out of my mouth. Uh, and so we get used to this idea that agency that produces temporal things must be temporal agency and that therefore when agents change things, agents are changed in order to be the changers of things. So if I, if I stood up, I could change this microphone's location, that's an accidental state of being in the microphone, it is in my hand, but I can make it lose that state of being by laying it on the floor and then it would gain the state of being on the floor, which it only potentially is right now, etc. You get this, this has potentiality, I have the power to actualize it, but I'm not actualizing it right now, so when I become the actor, and so this is the idea, that when things go forth for, from us productively in time, we automatically think, because this is how we experience it, that there's actually a change not just in the things we produce, but there's a change in the producer himself as he produces. But that actually is not, and this is where I want to make a philosophical point, not a theological one, because I think the mistake is actually philosophical here, and it only is consequently theological, which is this, that agents as such are not changed by their acts of agency ever. It's not, it's not as an agent that I'm undergoing change right now as I actualize new effects, like words coming out of my mouth. It's actually the fact that I'm not a pure agent, but I'm also a patient. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, I have, I'm a bundle of actuality and possibility. The possibility, uh, in, cer in a certain respect, are all the things I'm not doing but can be doing. If I actualize those possibilities, like the possibility of standing up, and then I could actualize it and like this, um, it's, not it's not in terms of my acting that I change, it's actually in terms of my own being acted upon. So as I actualize my potentiality to be standing, um, it, it, it seems like because I'm acting, I'm changing, but it's not because I'm acting that I'm changing, it's because I'm acting and also being acted upon because I'm multi-parted that I'm changing. That, I know, you're like, like three people are like, yeah. And then everyone else is like, <laughs> next question. But my, but this is my point. That's a, that is a philosophical, that, that is just a straight philosophical claim. Is the agent qua agent changed by its acts of agency? And the assumption is yes, and it's a philosophical mistake. It's not agency that changed me when I acted. It's the fact that I'm not pure agent and thereby, thereby was actually also patient in that action. That change. So, to the point. So, God is pure agent, says Aquinas. He's right because he doesn't have potentiality to actualize. So that when God, in fact, I say that, that's not even quite right. When God acts. You know when God acts? No when, because God's not in time. God is pure act. It's not a temporally indexed thing. So, God doesn't move from not creating to creating, because God doesn't move from one state of being to another, which is what would happen in that case. There's no potentiality that he's actualizing. 
So what's becoming in the, in the creation is the world. The world is coming to be in the act of creation ex nihilo. Um, that's, what be, that, that's where the newness lies. Interestingly though, even creation ex nihilo is not a change in creation. Uh, put a little differently, what did God cause to change when he made all things out of nothing in that absolute moment of coming to be of, the, of, the non of all non-divine things? What underwent a change in that moment? If it's creation ex nihilo, then you have to say nothing underwent a change. But then nothing isn't the kind of thing that undergoes changes, in my experience. Uh, you know what, nothing, nothing. That, what I mean is really, there's the Oxford Shorter Guide to Nothing. Have you guys seen that? I love those Oxford Shorter Guides. Do you have some of those? They're, they're nice. Um, <laughs> But, there's, but one of them is, I think, the Oxford Shorter Guide to Nothing, and I kid you not, it's like 160 pages long. And there are words on the page. And what they mean by that is some cosmic state of affairs of rarefied matter in a vacuous condition. They don't actually mean nothing, they mean a weird something. That's what they mean. Uh, but when we say creation ex nihilo, from nothing, uh, nothing isn't a little kind of strange something that changes so the creation ex nihilo is not actually a change in creation. The absolute coming to be of creation is not, precisely speaking, a change from a state of being. So, put it a little differently. There is no creation eve. You know what I mean? There's not, because time is, time is given with creation. Time does not exist outside of creation. And so there can't be the day before creation or the moment before. There is actually no moment before creation. If by moment you mean a temporally indexed time that actually gives way to something subsequent to it chronologically. Can you repeat that? I don't, no, because I don't, because I, no, no, because I don't, I don't comprehend that. So, I mean, I, I know why that must be true, but I don't, but I can't, um, you know what I'm saying? I know why it is true, but I can't imagine it. I mean, I can't imagine it. It's not familiar to me. So God, as the agent, of pure agent of creation, didn't act upon a patient? Not, in order to yeah, technically speaking, no. Like acting upon a patient like, would be like me changing the location of this microphone. This microphone is a patient. That is to say, it is able to receive operation from an agent. That's what makes it a patient. And I can operate upon it so as to relocate it to the floor. Or I could take a sledgehammer and operate upon it so as to disintegrate. I'm not going to, it's okay. But um, I could do it to, so as to just absolutely disintegrate so, it. So we have, so God brings into being being that had no being. Yeah, but even, you can't even say he brought into being being, because then you're acting like being was something there that he did something to. <sighs> creation's weird. You think the Trinity's weird, but creation's weird, well, too. Well, I, I tried to, if you were at my... And he wrote a book on it. If you were at my session, you would have known I said this, but... <laughs> Somebody asked me recently, just about an hour ago, do you listen to James much? And I said... Uh, only when he quotes scripture, so no, I don't listen to him much. <laughs> Come on. Uh, Thank you for that, so, 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 so what we're saying is create, okay, God, the act of divine creation is... is Maybe Matthew not, can help. God is not an agent acting upon a patient. He's bringing... A, not in creation, but we could say that that's the case in providence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in we're talking providence. ex nihilo. Okay? Yeah, okay. Not even forming man from the dust, because that's not really yeah, ex nihilo. Something's there. The, the creation of the soul is, but not of the yeah, body. Yeah, that's right. Not of the body. Uh, even, even to this day. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, lost my train of thought. Well, so the giants, anyway, they, they lost four in a row. I think we let Matthew jump in. <laughs> it, w it was the God giants? as an agent isn't working. He's bringing a, he's bringing a patient into existence. Yes, but he's not moving a patient into moving, existence from some other state. And so it's not properly speaking a change. So if he's the blessed God, what's that thing we call creatures? Why is it here? Because God made it. Matthew. No, but if you want me to temporally index that for you, it's not going to work. Maybe we could focus on that word blessed for a minute. Yeah. To, to peel back just slightly another layer. Um, 
James just said a minute ago that this is incomprehensible. Um, one of the reasons why, though we can still talk about it in the way that, that James is, is because if we actually deny it, let me put this, let me put more positively. If we actually say creation is a change, or we even go further, which is oftentimes where people go with this and say, well, there must be a change in God. It's not merely that we, we now have a massive contradiction uh, between an immutable God and the world, the creator-creature distinction as we call it, but we also have compromised the godness of God. In other words, when, we, when scripture uses a word like blessed, it's referring to a God who is absolutely complete. In other words, if there is any type of becoming in God, that implies God is not complete. And if he is not complete, he is not, he is not maximally alive. And if he's not maximally alive, how in the world could he be complete in his happiness? This is, this is our layman way of saying he, is, he, he could not then be the perfect being. So this is why Anselm in particular spends so much time not just setting up an argument for the existence of God, but then saying, how then do the attributes of God help us understand God as the perfect being? He doesn't mean, oh, God is just better than you. No, what he means is God is absolutely complete. There's nothing lacking in him. So when, I know sometimes when we put things negatively, it can sound as if, oh, God does not change, and it, it can almost sound as if, oh, there's something missing in God. But when we say that, you have to understand, we are actually saying God could not be more alive. He's not like you. He's not like me. He does not grow weary or faint. This is how scripture starts to describe it, right? He is so alive. He is so complete. He is so absolute. He is so pure actuality that to somehow ascribe to him any state of becoming, it would forfeit all of that. And we know this, we, at least we should, we know this from examining ourselves. We know how incomplete, even though we give a veneer of something else, we are very incomplete creatures. And therefore, we are constantly seeking, pursuing happiness. But that is not, that is not the case with God. So this is why, even when we talk about the Trinity, we can, we can, this, we can complicate things. <laughs> we can take this into the Trinity, right? And we can say, we can refer to the land of the happy Trinity. Why did, why did so many in the great tradition use that word happy? Well, that's another, maybe even a doxological way of trying to describe something philosophically and theologically to say, this God is not incomplete. He is so maximally alive, he does not need to become anything more than he already is eternally. To, just to wrap that question, because I want to let you go to another one, and just briefly, um, I think what we should say about creator is there is a sense in which God comes to be named as creator. He doesn't come to be creator, meaning creating is something he eternally and timelessly does, but what is created is temporal. And in so much as we name him creator from the standpoint of being created, uh, we, na we, we say things like God became creator. We do the same thing with salvation. You'll find this in like in Isaiah 63. That's in the Bible, Richard. So... <laughs> I, I know a few Bible verses. Um, Chapters and verses aren't the same thing. Autographer. I know. Ex now you want me to exegete them. So that's all right. Well, in there, he says, so God became their savior. And so the question is, when the Bible talks that way, is the idea that there was God not in the state of not being, that would be the incompleteness that Matthew's talking about, not being savior. And then God changes when he becomes savior. And if we could ask this about yourself individually, when you were saved, did God undergo a change? You could say God became my savior. You could say that, but are you saying that God himself took on a new state of being in virtue of this new relationship you have to him? And I think from that standpoint, what's happening is in the case of Israel, when he brings them out of Egypt and he brings them to himself and becomes their savior, what makes, what makes that language work is that they are placed in a new relation. There's a newness of relation in the creature to God, which results in a newness of name for God. So I can give God a new, like I could say to somebody, 
you need to repent and believe the gospel because God is your judge and he is your enemy and he will condemn you. And then let's say the person by his grace believes the gospel, repents and embraces Christ Jesus. And I, and I could say to the same person, and that person could say of himself, God has become my savior. The question is, did God himself undergo an alteration and an augmentation or a newness or an acquisition of being in becoming savior? Or is it that I am now through the gospel and through his grace, placed in a new relationship to him. So that the change is actually in our relation, the newness is in our relation to him. When we enter in on our side to new relations to God, we predicate new names to God. So creator would be a name that is predicated from the standpoint of creation, which is a new thing that came to be, not by passing through a change and all that. I, that's, I guess that's where I'd want to maybe leave that question. If I could add one more thing. Uh, I know that this can sound technical, but our entire understanding of God, the world, and Christianity itself depends on this. In philosophical language, we might call this a participation metaphysic, but it's simply just Acts 17, and it has huge evangelistic import. Right? You remember Acts 17, Paul in Athens discussing with these philosophers in the Areopagus, what does Paul do? He's very strategic, right? What does he do? He goes right for, for a society. He says, God does not need you. <laughs> what, that's, that's Paul's way of describing everything that we've been describing here. He is not a needy God. He does not depend on you. Why? Because he, he's not a God who changes. Why? You see, you, you, you continue to fill it all in. But notice when Paul says that, it's on the basis of that creator-creature distinction, establishing God as ase, a God of aseity. And by the way, aseity doesn't just merely mean God is self-existent and self-sufficient. It means more. It means God actually is, emphasis on the word is, he, is a, he absolutely is life in and of himself. Now hold that thought. Because then you can understand everything else in creation in its proper perspective. What are we? Well, we have life, but by, part by participation, because we are dependent creatures. And so this is why in Acts 17, Paul can go on to say he's not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In other words, the whole reason we can see God as the source is because he is a God who is ase. And then notice what Paul says next. And he made, right, Here's, here comes this doctrine of creation, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And that's when, this comes back to our earlier discussion of natural theology, Paul does something that I think probably a lot of Christians are uncomfortable with today. He quotes from one of their own. Interesting apologetic move. In him we live and move and have our being. How Greek of Paul. <laughs> How strategic, right? He is confronting them with what they should know. It's very, very Romans-like, isn't it? And on that basis, he can then say, quotes again, for we are indeed his offspring. So all that to say, I know this is a technical point, but it's crucial to get right, because otherwise you reverse that participation metaphysic, or you do away with it altogether, and what are you left with? Well, you start to creep closer and closer to idolatry. Good, real quick. So are you trying to say that in terms of creator, creature, or the relation that creatures have with their creator, is our creator is only a giver? Yes. And creatures are only no, I wouldn't want to say only. Okay. Uh, we're, get, we're, we're getter givers. We're getter God's gi just a giver giver. God is a giver, and we are getter givers. Yeah, because, because uh, God gives us gifts, and then we are called to bestow those upon others in acts of charity, love, and good deeds. And so we are operators, and we are real agents, yeah, and we really cause things. So I would, I would want to say we're givers, but we're just not givers to God. Yes, right. And we are we enriched don't supply, by God. Don't God, is God, not, God is not enriched yeah. or enhanced by us. And even when Scripture does use language to refer to us giving to God, it very quickly clarifies, but you are only given to God what is already His. 
right? That's why your pastor gets up here on Sunday morning and says, please give your money. <laughs> but you're not giving to God. Matthew, we're, something. Not, we're not Southern Baptist. We don't yeah, yeah, that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Our <laughs> offering's in the back. We don't say anything about it. <laughs> Guys are so passive aggressive. Uh, the deacons are all packing, though. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's just... Especially in Wyoming. Rich. It's not even passive. Yeah, it's not even... Oh. But the point is... The point is, right, there's a certain spiritual humility that should characterize you. Because in your heart, at that moment, if you dare think, I am, I am benefiting God, what would his kingdom do without me? How would his mission, we think this, you don't want to admit it, but you think this way, don't you? I know, I've caught myself thinking this way. What would he do? How would he, that is a complete violation of his completeness, of our proper participation in him as the source. Yes, we give, but we, we do so as beggars, as Luther said. Thank you for that. that that's, that's a lot, and at... <clears throat> And at the uh, rate of time it's taken us to get through three questions, I think we only have time for one more. Um, and I think it, it kind of wraps up a lot of what we've been discussing. Um, just to kind of put a finer point on these things, in thinking about the incomprehensibility of God, uh, three out of four of you are currently pastors right now, I think. And, and what would you say to someone in your church, a, a Christian who comes to you and and Here's some of this. Here's the big words, uh, you know, long philosophical explanations of some of these things regarding the doctrine of God and, and the, the finer doctrines uh, underneath that umbrella. What would you say to them when they say, Pastor, this is, this is too hard for me to understand. Is it worth the effort? Is it, how, how am I supposed to even uh, uh, begin to understand some of these things? Uh, what, what kind of advice or encouragement would you give them? Sam, you want to uh, start there? In the Psalms, especially Psalm 139, um, David talks about God's omniscience and his omnipresence and his omnipotence. And he even says, I can't comprehend it. <laughs> it's beyond me. Hmm. But rather than feeling defeated, he's actually moved to worship and to doxology. And so the first thing is I would encourage the person by saying that that shortness that you feel where you, you can't reach, you can't grasp, um, you're a creature. That, that just shows the infinity uh, and the greatness and the majesty of the God you're, you're trying to, to know. And as I'm sure was said last night, I wasn't able to attend. Although God, we cannot comprehend him, we can apprehend him. You know him truly. You don't know him fully, but you know him truly, and you know him enough to know him as your creator and as your redeemer and as your provider and your benefactor, and you can worship him. Um, or Psalm 131, O oh Lord, I am not high-minded. Uh, my eyes are not lifted up. Um, and so the, the psalmist is humble, and, and then the psalmist says, but rather, I do not occupy myself with things that are too great for me. Rather, I have behaved and quieted my soul my soul is even as a weaned child within me. Uh, let Israel trust in the Lord from henceforth and forevermore. The psalmist, that's it. That's all Psalm 131. The psalmist says, I don't occupy myself with things too great for me. My soul is like a weaned child. The weaned child sits by his mother and waits for his food in, in silent patient patience. Uh, and so also we, when we reach the limits of our understanding, we should sit there quietly with a contented soul uh, and say, I trust in the Lord. And so not only, not only can we say that, but then we can also say that the church and its resources for some time has probably failed you, brother or sister, mm. and you, you can know more than you think. Mm. Um, you, you can learn more than you think. And I want to help you by recommending certain resources or such things. People sell themselves short. Uh, well, I can't say it like this person can say it, or I could never write that book. Okay, but you can understand, and you can grow and, and advance in your understanding. And so I would not want them to think that it's an impossible hurdle to, to have a better knowledge of God. And I would want them to see that whatever their knowledge of God is, they can still praise God for it and be content and patient in it. 
And one last thing is to tell them that I believe that the resources of the great tradition often teach this so much better than it's taught today. Um, my own knowledge of the doctrine of God and other things has been so advanced by reading older works that have spent so much time thinking this through and how to explain it, and they've just done so much work that doesn't need to be done again. And I'm not saying pure repristination, just take it, dust, dust it off, and send it off again. Some works you can do that. But to, to learn from them, to, to gather from their investment of knowledge and their wisdom and their experience. You know, if your parents ask you to help them out with their computer, they're so pleased that you just know how to do it so much faster than they do. And so also, when we have trouble with the doctrine of God, you read older writers, and it's just so pleasing, it's so pleasant, when they know what they're doing. <laughs> they know how to do it, and they can help us uh, so much more. So I would want that sister or that brother to worship the Lord, to be patient in the Lord, and to be more confident in their ability to learn when good resources are given to them. Yeah. Anyone else? I'll just, I'll just say I think one important thing is, is, that, is to recognize that some of the verbiage and some of the conceptual uh, depths that our tradition helps us into and helps us uh, in seeing the doctrines are not, are not the... Uh, how can I put it, the, the indispensable keys to believing. So that even divine simplicity, you could believe the doctrine of divine simplicity and never have heard of the doctrine of divine simplicity or have heard of the distinction of principles of act and passive potency. But if you believe that there's that God does not depend on what isn't God to be God or do what he does, then you're already committed to this doctrine of divine simplicity and all of the verbiage is actually just details. It is. It's a way of defending that hardcore Christian belief. And I think, that, I think that's something that we should affirm, that people in a simple faith are already, in believing their Bibles, committed to the great tradition. The great tradition is just a way of guarding and preserving uh, and maintaining and even enriching that faith. But it, it's, not a re it's not the access to that faith. It's the explanation of that. It's the, it's the accounting of that faith. But that faith itself comes from a belief in the Holy Scriptures, and that even the simplest believer can have. Yeah, I think sometimes, because I do hear this a lot, I think sometimes behind that type of question, or sometimes it can turn into a type of objection, is a mistaken dichotomy between theology and your spirituality. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote a, a short a little preface or introduction to Athanasius's classic book on the Incarnation. And Lewis, who's this great mind, uh, makes a confession. He says, whenever I read all the, the spiritual books, I walk away hungry. But when I pick up a tough bit of theology with a pencil in hand, I find myself on my knees ready to worship God. So comes back to your point here, because I think we ha in our day, we have this very odd, but very new distinction in our minds between, oh, that's theology, and I really need to be about what's practical. That is so strange. I mean, that's really defiant, really bucks against the very essence of Christianity and what it means for you to be a Christian. I mean, think of David in Psalm 27. What, is, what does David want more than anything? He, he prays to God, and he, he makes this petition and says, I have one passion, I have one desire, to gaze at the beauty of the Lord. That is profoundly theological, and we can come around that, we can circle around that, as the great tradition does, and start adding a vocabulary so that we're carefully articulating what that does and does not mean. And at the same time, at the very same time, that is not removed then for its implications, in David's case, as you mentioned, to sit there and to, to dwell with in, in God's presence and to, to contemplate God. So at the very root of this issue, I would say pastors need to do a much better job of teaching their people what theology actually should be. Theology is... At, at its very essence and at its very goal, it's all about contemplation. David wants to see God.
God, period, because he believes that is where his happiness is located because God is his source. So if we understand theology in that sense as a type of contemplation that ultimately leads us to the beatific vision in the end, all, all of a sudden then the question is mute. First time I read the New Testament, I was 22, and it used a lot of words I'd never heard of. Well, I had heard of them, but I'd never heard them defined. Uh, propitiation, reconciliation, justification, sanctification, adoption. I used a dictionary, looked up the meaning, and then slowly but surely kept going to church and singing hymns that were using the same terms and using it in different contexts. And lo and behold, I learned. I learned by liturgy sitting under the word, singing the word, hearing the word sung to me. So at our church, what we do is we require for all our members to have a, a copy of the second edition of Muller's Dictionary of Theological Greek and Latin and Theological Terms. Uh, uh, kidding, we don't. Um, while but why preach. is what? Yeah, while first, I preach. First edition's fine. No, first edition is not fine. <laughs> oh boy. Um, but I, why does everybody like edition, our Second edition, which Muller only. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Why did mo why do most people, not everybody, like R.C. Sproul? It's because he assumed God's people had intellects, had minds, and they wanted to know more and deeper stuff. And he used the terms, didn't he? And he'd write them down on the board, and then yeah, like dirt. <laughs> he got he got that from John Gershner, and he he had mannerisms like John Gershner, kind of like Dr. Renahan had follows me, you know. And <laughs> even though he's way older than me. Uh, but Sproul used threw the term out there and you're going, what? And he said, let's, let's break this word down. You know? And he break the word down and he come back nine stories later. <laughs> right? It's like, come on, we don't need the nine. Three's enough. Two or three witnesses, that's all you need. That's in the Bible. Uh, and he would, and, and he would, he would call the people of God up to a level of knowledge and contemplation that you weren't at before by defining the key terms. So I, I used to, as a preacher, struggle with preaching because I didn't want to use the terms, and I don't care anymore. I use the term. I use perichoresis. I got, I got a guy that's done time in prison, used to sell drugs, and I was preaching, uh, and I was gonna use that term, and instead of using it, I said, I'm not gonna use the term, I'm gonna just explain the concept. After the sermon, he came up to me, basically, you know, I give money to this church. You, you owe me the terms, and the concepts embodied in the terms. I have found that when you do that, when you assume people aren't stupid, that they're smart, and they wanna, they wanna get educated, uh, when you go to church, it's not time to check out your brain. It's time to gird up the loins of your mind and think about the best things to think about together with you know, the other saints. I, I think we should use the technical terminology, not overdo it like James does. <laughs> but do it like Matthew and Sam and I do. You know, we... <laughs> That's all I got to say. Okay, before you change your mind, let's go ahead and uh, <laughs> close in prayer. Matthew, can I ask you to go ahead and close our time in prayer? Lord, we are very thankful. We are so privileged to be able to come together like this, to think about the deep things of God. Lord, we don't take that for granted. I pray that for those who are here, that they would be able to go back and return to your word, read the great books of the great tradition. Lord, may they have an understanding that comes out of faith, and may it lead them, as, day, as, as it did for David, to gaze at your beauty. May they desire that more than anything. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our mediator. Amen. 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 Can we uh, uh, thank our speakers for their work and their uh, conversation today? Thank you.
Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break, and we'll start our next session at 3 o'clock.